साहिब जी सूरा सो पहचानिया जो लरादीन कहे पुरजा पुरजा कट मरा कब हु न छाड खेत सूरा सो पहचानिया जो लरा दीन के हेत पुरजा पुरजा कट मरा कब हु न छाड खेत पुरजा पुरजा कट मरा कब हु न छाड खेत गुरु प्यारी गुरु सारी साध संग दी गाज बाज की फतेह प्रवान करो जी वाहेगुरु जी का खालसा वाहे गुरु जी की फतेह सो विद गुरु साहब कृपा वो ब्लेस्ड बी सेइंग इन द चरण ऑफ गुरु ग्रंथ साहिब जी महाराज पूरन गुरु सत गुरु एंड आफ्टर हियरिंग सम ब्यूटीफुल कीर्तन फ्रॉम फ्रॉम द यंग फ्रॉम द यंग सिक्स विद गुरु साहब कृपा फॉर अराउंड 45 टू 50 मिनट्स फॉर जस्ट अंडर एन आवर वी आर गोइंग टू ब्रीफली गो ओवर द इवेंट्स ऑफ चरासी ऑफ 1984 एंड द कलुकारा द जेनोसाइड दैट टुक प्लेस within amritsar and also across punjab and also following in november in, in delhi so just before we get into 1984 and what happened as the attack on sri harmandir sahib as we all know of it's merely it's more or less impossible to go straight to 1984 without understanding what happened beforehand and without understanding the context of it and the build up and what led to that attack happening Ansari Harmandar Sahib So let's cast our minds back to 1947 quite a few years before 1984 and a memorable year for a lot of people and many of you many of you will know that it was the end independence of India and the creation of India So first of all what did the Sikh kaum do for the azadi of of of, of India what part did we play and how crucial was the sikh kaum in freeing india from the british government so first of all 77% of shaheeds of shahidiya of people that gave their lives for the movement for the freedom of india were sikh 81% of imprisonments life imprisonments that took place due to repressive actions from the english regime were of sikh faith as sad singh ji may not sound it might sound like a lot but to put that into context this is a time in india when only 2 to 3% of the population were sick so 2 to 3% of the sick of the indian population were sick yet we were given around 80% of all the qurbaniyan to free bharat but that's not a problem for us because guru sahib themselves guru tegh bahadur ji maharaj themselves laid out the foundation and showed us and guru guru arjan dev ji maharaj showed us that if need be to give our lives either for sikhi or for the protection of anyone else that's no small that's no problem now when the time came sikhs were hailed for their bravery sikhs were hailed for the amazing things that they did and nehru the current the prime minister at the time he hailed sikhs and said i see no reason why the sikhs shouldn't experience the goal of freedom within a region in the north of punjab sikhs and hindus have fought this together Sikhs belong within India don't make your own country also you have so called mahatma gandhi who said that sikhs have no reason to feel that they can't trust the indians and if at any time the indian establishment decided to turn their back on the sikhs then let it know that they will be sealing their own fate and that would be the beginning of their own doom so all these fake promises all these fake allegiances were made in a hope that the sikh kaum would stay within india and please let pledge their alliance to the indian flag so now we come to the creation of india and india was created as a federal republic now what that means is each state can govern itself 
with the majority of things. So each state has its own set of laws, each state has its own set of rules. And these all come under the umbrella of Delhi. Now, a lot of people question, why did we not take our own land? Why did we not take Punjab? And a few of the factors that may have swayed why Sikhs didn't take that, that chance that we had was firstly that 20% of Punjab was Sikh, so we would have been a minority within Punjab. Now, by this time, the Sikh psyche had been chipped away at and chipped away at to think that we, we aren't leaders anymore and we're just civil obedience to whoever requires of us. We have ruled, whether that was under the time of Maharaj Ranjit Singh Ji or Bhatta Singh Bahadur, even in those Raj, even in those kingdoms, we were minorities. So there was nothing to say that even if 20% of Punjab was Sikh, there was no reason why the Sikh could not have ruled that, as we have done in our past. But the chipping away at the Sikh society and the Sikh sovereignty had caused quite a lot of doubt about this. And a lot of people felt that without having the majority within Punjab, it wouldn't have been successful. Secondly, Tara Singh, or Master Tara Singh, as, as he's known as, he was one of the main people at the, seats of the, at the seats of the table for the Sikhs. And he was an Indian patriot. And he was fully against independence for Sikhs and saw his allegiance also to the government of India. So him being a big player in, in, in deciding whether we get independence or not also was a big factor. So Punjab was split in half by the English government and it's a fraction of what it currently used to be under the time of Maharaj and Jeet Singh We will see that old map of the butterfly-shaped Punjab that used to be huge, that would span from Lahore up into Afghanistan and right down into the middle of India. And it was split and there was a massive land grab. So Lahore, the capital of Punjab, was taken from us and given to Pakistan. And then all of the Muslims that were staying, many of the Muslims in India, wanted to get over to Pakistan. And a lot of the Hindus and Sikhs that were living in Pakistan, or now made Pakistan, wanted to get back to Punjab. And a lot of killings, a lot of atrocities happened due to that. There was a lot of chaos for quite a while. So as I mentioned earlier, Punjab, um, Punjab was split in half and given to India. The rest was made into what we know as Pakistan. And now, from 1947, from the, the birth of India, our problems started. Well, our problems continued, should I say. As, as I mentioned earlier, Punjab, India was run as a federal government. So each state was governed by its own laws, except for Punjab. So the first problem we have after independence are our basic human rights being taken away from us. These are rights such as Article 25 within the Indian Constitution that still states that Sikhs, Buddhists and other religions are under a, come under a sect of Hinduism. So firstly not recognizing that we are sovereign, we are our own calm and not recognizing and just brushing us under the same panel as Hindus. Secondly, the Ananda Karaj Act is taken away from us, saying that Sikhs don't have their own wedding ceremony and it comes also under the, the Hindu one as well. Punjabi, Punjab, Punjabi language, every state would teach that respective state's language as a first, as you'd expect. So Gujarat, Gujarat had Gujarati being spoken and so on and so on. But Punjab, for some reason, had Hindi as its first language and Punjabi as the secondary. So all these things start to creep in and a bigger picture starts to emerge. Also, many of us know that Punjab, well, Punjab quite literally means land of five rivers. It was then split into three, but still the energy and the resources created from the rivers of Punjab, even till today, are a massive commodity. But for some reason, even though a lot of the water was being generated and was being distilled within Punjab, 75% of the energy created from water was being distributed to other states. And also 70% of Punjab's revenue was also being distributed to other states for their development. So we were getting the straw, straw, straw in every single path. So to combat these, the Sikh and the Punjab, the people of Punjab wake up. And in 1955, we see the emergence of the Punjabi Suba movement. And one of its priorities was to get the Punjabi language reinstalled as the first language of Punjab, along with it a few others 
a few of the humanitarian rights, basic human rights that every other state had. For some reason, we were having to fight for it. So in 1955, over 12,000 people courted arrest under the Punjabi Subha movement. And the Indian government actually stepped foot and arrested people within Siri Harmandar Sahib. So before we even get to 1984, there have been many times that the Indian establishment and other leaders prior to that stepped foot and even attacked Siri Harmandar Sahib. So 1984 was most definitely not the first. Then in 1966, 11 years later, we see that Punjab is cut even more. Punjab loses Haryana and also Himachal Pradesh. And now the capital of um, Punjab, which is Chandigarh, now is no longer in Punjab. So the irony of having a capital that doesn't even exist in your state, that's what the Sikhs are facing now. And it was a very clever move by the Indian government because by doing so, by having their capital outside of the land of Punjab, what they were able to do was claim it as Union territory because it's now, it still is today, the shared capital of Haryana and Punjab. Now, a state under Union territory doesn't abide by the same rules as every other state within a federal republic. It means that the Union territory is now governed by Delhi and is now governed by the capital. So again, stripping away our sovereignty, stripping away our rights, and now everything is being dictated from Delhi. So slowly, slowly, there's a deprivation of power, of resources, of money being stripped away from Punjab. Now, you've got the political aspect of these attacks on Punjab, but you've also got other aspects, other attacks coming from the outside, not only on Punjab, but on Sikhs indefinitely. So firstly, we have this so-called Green Revolution taking place. And this is a time where Punjabi farmers are being encouraged to use things like fertilizers and pesticides so that their crop will grow a bigger yield. What they aren't being told is that the fertilizer and the pesticides actually damage the soil. So over the first few years, you may get a bigger yield of crop, but then because of the reduction in the, the quality of soil, that crop starts to decrease and decrease and decrease. And the quality of that crop also starts to degrade as well. So then the Punjab farmers are finding them themselves in a massive circle, a debt cycle, because they're having to buy more pesticides, more pharmaceuticals, more certain pharmaceuticals, more pesticides, so that they can account for the loss of yield that they're experiencing from the previous year because of the soil getting worse and worse. This cycle increases and increases. Many Punjabi farmers can start to commit suicide because they can't pay off the debts. Even till today within Punjab, it has one of the highest rates of farmer suicides within the world because this cycle is still going. So they're not necessarily using guns or paper to kill us. They're using different formats. Secondly, you have anti-Sikh parties trying to infiltrate Sikhi, as they still do today. So you have groups like the RSS who are trying to confuse Sikh and trying to take Sikh, Sikhi under its own wing as a wing of Hinduism, which is clearly not. So the RSS culminate many ideas, one being, I don't want to say this in the Dabar side, but for the, for the Sangha to understand what kind of attacks we're being put under, is firstly saying that Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji did nothing for the Hindus. He was executed because they were a thief, a thief. So things such like this propaganda wars were created. And secondly, you would see images of the 10 Gurus in the stomach of a cow and the Dod coming out saying that is what the Amrit is. All these things started to attack the psyche of the Sikh and for us and to detach us from our philosophy, detach us from the truth and detach us from the thought of Sikhi. So all this is going on and Punjabis come together and form the Anand Sahib resolution in 1973. Now this was the resolution that outlined the humanic, uh, humanitarian rights, the social economical rights that the Punjabis were demanding from the Indian government that had been leading up from 1947. So now just to reflect on where we're at, a calm, a religion that gave 80% of Shahidiyya for the freedom of a country is now fighting that same country for its own rights, not even for its own freedom. And nothing's changed since. So then what does the Anandpur Sahib resolution ask for? What are its main demands? So sim very simple things. 
share uh, fair water usage, fair water distribution within Punjab, fair electricity distribution. Even if you go back into Punjab today, you'll find an electricity shut, uh, cut out. Bijli chalgi. When a lot of bijli, a lot of electricity is actually made in Punjab. So the question is, why are we still facing shortages? Chandigarh also to be returned back to Punjab. And simple things such as a radio station being put within Sri Harmandar Sahib so that Sangat across the world can, see, can, can listen to Kirtan from Darbar Sahib. So nothing radical, nothing revolutionary, just basic human rights that every other state seemed to have got. But for some reason, the Indian government forgot about us. Now, whilst this is going on, we have Indira Gandhi who's coming to power. And she's pulled a stunt within 1975. Out of fear of losing votes, she did electoral fraud and was caught red-handed. She took the government into a state of emergency and banned all those cabinet ministers. So it was literally a dictatorship. Now, a lot of India went on protest against Indira Gandhi at this point, realizing what she was doing and how she was trying to manipulate herself to power again. And out of 140,000 people that took court arrest, 40,000 were sick. So just under a third of people that were arrested when protesting against Indira Gandhi and her state of emergency, 30%, uh, under a third were sick, again at a time when we were a very, very small minority. So this is a thorn in the feet of Indira Gandhi. And you can say it's the first emergence of Sikhs causing a problem for her. Secondly, Indira Gandhi, the second mention of Indira Gandhi here, 1975, Maaf Karna, on the 300th anniversary year of the Shaheed Deepur of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji Maharaj. And there's a massive event organized within Delhi to commemorate the 300th year of Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji Shaheed Deepur. And reports say that around 2.2 million people were present at those celebrations. And the 12th leader of Damdami Taksal, Sanskartar Singh Deepin Dranwale, they were also present. And our history writes, eyewitness account writes, eyewitness accounts write that as Indira Gandhi walked within the Darbar side, Sanskartar Singh Ji was sitting, and Guru Granth Sahib Ji was also present as well. Many of the Sangat stood up to pay respects to the Prime Minister that was walking in, but Sanskartar Singh Ji stayed seated. Now, after Indira Gandhi talked, after she said her two pence on stage, Sankartar Singh Ji went up. And Sankartar Singh Ji was fearless, just as many of the leaders of Damdami Diksal were at the time. Sankartar Singh Ji will talk about later as well. And Sankartar Singh Ji had no fear for any so-called king of the world, for any so-called prime minister of the world, in the presence, whilst they were sitting in the true king, in the presence of the true king, Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj. And upon starting their speech, they made very clear to the Sangat, the Galti, that everyone had just done, of standing up for someone who owes nothing to the Guru, for someone that has nothing to give to the Guru Kar, and for someone that has just committed electoral fraud. And Sangat Singh Ji fearlessly said that even if Indira Gandhi came, gave her head, chopped off her head and put it in the charan of Guru Granth Sahib Ji, the amount of times that accumulate to their, all the hairs on her body, even then, the debt that she owes and the Indian establishment and Hindus in general owe Guru, Guru Tegh Bahadur Ji, even then that debt would not be paid. So very fiercely and very straight, Sankarta Singh Ji said that we owe her no respect. Rather, she owes respect to Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj and the Qurbani that our Gurus laid down for, this, for, this, for what was to be this, this country. So this was obviously another thorn in her foot. And slowly, slowly, her hatred for the Sikhs started to come about. So five years later, Sanjana Singh Ji in 1977 is established as the 13th leader, the 13th leader of Dandami Taksal. And they also start to capture the hearts of people all around Punjab. They start and they follow on from their predecessors, Sant Kirtar Singh Ji, and also Sant Gyani Gurbachan Singh Ji Khas Up in Rawali, who had started doing prachar all across Punjab, starting freeing people from the shackles of nashi, of drugs, and also of alcohol as well. And a lot of people started coming into the fold of Sikhi. Now the government obviously weren't happy about this because 
their whole agenda was to break Punjabis and Sikhs all across India away from the truth that is Sikhi. And now you may be wondering why is there such a hatred against Sikhi? Why have so many establishments, whether it was the Indian establishment currently, whether it was the Mughal Raj before, why are these people all attacking Sikhi? Now Saad Singh, do you have to understand what does Sikhi represent? What has Sikhi come to do? Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj says, I've come to start a panth within this world that will give deg and deg for everyone. That will give deg, that will give food, that will give basic necessities to anyone that needs it. And deg, who will offer their protection and pull out the sword whenever need be. Now this is a direct threat to any establishment that bases itself on tyranny. Whether that was the Mughals or whether that was the oppress oppressive Indian regime that still continues today. How many times in the recent news have we heard of rapes or bad doings within India still going on? The so-called largest democracy within the world is still going through such bad times. So it's because of this direct threat that we, oppose, that we have with such leaders that people see Sikhi as a threat. And for many generations, for the birth of Sikhi, have tried to consume it, whether that was the British, whether that was the Mughals, or whether that was the Indian establishment now. So Sanjan El Singhji is starting to captivate the hearts of the people of Punjab. And before we think who was Sanjan El Singhji, just a little bit about who Sanjan El Singhji was, because they were one of the key figures in the build up and also in 1984, in the attack on Sri Harmandar Sahib. And Saad Singhji, don't ever think that Sanjan El Singhji was a random person that just took charge when need be. Within Sikhi, Guru Hargobin Sahibji Maharaj planted the seed of Sant Safai within each Khalsa that sits here today and each Khalsa that has come before. A saint and a soldier aspect. Now understand how the saint aspect comes first. Only whilst becoming a Sant, then are we prepared, then are we ready, then are we capable to pick up a Shastar, pick up a sword, pick up a Bandook, whatever it may be, and then sit on the battlefield and become victorious. And Sanjan El Singhji was the epitome of a Sant Safai. They stayed for many years within Damdami Dam Dam Daksal, doing Seva, doing Simran, earning Sikhi, and advancing to a very, very high spiritual level. And just one Sakhi I'd like to share with you guys of the nature of Sanjan El Singhji is taken from Gyani Thakur Singhji. And they talk about an eyewitness account when they were staying with Sanjan El Singhji at Dam Dami Daksal. And Gyaniji talks about when they went away with Sant Kartar Singhji once to a program. And all the things at the time, their kashere used to be very dirty because they would quickly wash their kashere, they wouldn't spend much time, they wouldn't put much saban on them, and they would all be hung up. And every time the things would go out, Gyani Thakur Singhji along with the other Jatha Singhs would go out with Sant Kartar Singhji. Every time they come back, all their kashere would be gleaming white. And they started to question, who's cleaning Gola Kashere? Who is doing the seva? And Gyani Thakur Singhji one day saw Sanjana El Singhji one by one taking the Kashere of each of the things off to the hoses, going to the bathrooms and by hand manjing each of the things Kashere. So the seva and the humility that Santi had was immense and showed in the times of need and showed in the times leading up to 1984. So Santi was that Sant who then took up the lead of a Safai, who then took up the lead of a general with Sikhi behind them and Sikhi already imbued within them. So just another Sakhi about Sanjana El Singhji. People had so much faith within Sanjana El Singhji and so little faith within the Punjab police that many a time Sikhs and non-Sikhs within Punjab would come to Sanjana El Singhji asking them to resolve their affairs because they had no faith in the Punjab police because it would either be if you had a status, you'd be looked after, or if you had money, you'd be looked after. Otherwise, you could get lost. And one such occurrence is of a Hindu bibi, a lady from a Hindu background, who had newly been married into a family, and she was from a very, very poor background. Now, this, the, the in-law's side, the husband's side, they'd been trying to take money from her family, and because of her guribi, because of her wealth, because of the little wealth she had, They'd been taking it out on her. They'd been harassing her and abusing her because of the lack of money her parents could, could support them with. 
And she came to Sanjay Nair Singh Ji, fell at the, the feet of Guru Sahib and explained the situation that I'm being harassed by my in-laws because we have no money and because I'm from a poor background. Sanjay Nair Singh Ji, that moment said, are you, you're currently the daughter of a Hindu. Are you willing to be the daughter of a Sikh? And she says, Hanji Santi. And Sanjay Nair Singh Ji said, chill, take here. And Sanjay Nair Singh Ji sent a few things over to that house and brought that family forward, the family that had been abusing her. And Sanjay Nelson, you said, I heard that you've been mis mis um, mistreating my daughter. What's the problem? And they all stood there with their heads down, realizing the atrocities that they've been doing to this poor girl. And Sanjay Nelson, you said, if it's a problem of money, here you go. And they placed a tray full of notes in front of that family and said, never lay a hand on her again. So don't ever think that Sanjay Nelson came to the protection of Sikhs, whether it was a Hindu or a Muslim. Anyone that was facing injustice, Sanjay Nair Singh Ji, the sayings of the times, would always go to their help. And that's why they were loved, and that's why they were followed so much within Punjab, and had the trust of the Punjabis. So a year later, we see another historic event in 1978. At the time of Asaki, when the fake cult, the Nirankari cult, who had claimed, whose leader, Gurbachana, who had claimed to be the form of Guru Gobind Singh Ji upon, their, on, upon this earth. This Muruk dared to take out a procession, dared to do a Nagar Kirtan around Sri, Har Sri Amritsar Sahib at the time of Vasakhi in 1978. And this Muruk, the, thing, the kind of things he did, where he would put his feet upon the, upon the takht of Sri Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj. As we have Panj Piyari bestowed upon to us by Guru Gobind Singh Ji Maharaj, this fool said that he's now made seven sat sitar, seven stars, and even pretended to make his own form of Amrit. So direct attack on Sikhi and direct Biyadabi upon Guru Sahib. And other things obviously were not going to stand for this. So in 1978, to go and protest, many things of the Akhanda Kiti Nijata, along with a few things from Damdami Tuksal, went to do a peaceful protest. Upon protesting and going to the police, the police said, the Nagar Kitan is nearly over, go back, it will sort it out. Nothing was sorted and the Nagar Kirtan was still carrying on. Then the Sengs took it upon themselves to go to, see to, to go to this Nagar Kirtan and protest in front of them. And upon going to protest, they were faced with not only the Nirankaris attacking the Sikhs, but also the police watching as bystanders and supplying the Nirankaris with weapons, with acid, and with whatever else they needed, whatever else protection they needed. And because of that, there were 13 Sengs Shaheed at that time, including by Fawja Singh Ji, who is an amazing Gursikh as well. And this sparked an vengeance within many Gursikhs at the time, especially the Naujwan. And Sanjay Nair Singh Ji took it upon themselves to avenge the, the, the Shaheed Diyan of these 13 Gursikhs. Just want to clear, clear a few things about Sanjay Nair Singh Ji. A lot of people, a lot of accusations have been put against Sanjay Nair Singh Ji. He was part of Congress. Why was he, why was he in Akal Takht? Why was he doing all, thing, all these things? And if these questions are in your head, please bear with them, and we'll come to them within a minute. So following, four years later, following the attack, the Nirankari massacre in 1978, tensions are rising, and the demand for the Anand Prasad resolution is growing, with Sikhs courting arrest by many means through Morche, through doing peaceful protests, and it culminates in to what we know as the Taram Yud Morcha in 1982. So for nine years, Sikhs pro peacefully protested for their basic human rights, which was asked from 1947, based off the promises that we were given. So now the Taram Yud Morcha, Taram Yud basically means a war of righteousness, Morcha is an agitation, was taking this Anantabar Sahib resolution, but going the next step now. Going to, seek, going to seek justice and demanding it. So many people courted arrest out of protest. And at one point, there were so many people that had courted arrest in Punjab that police had literally no space for any more prisoners. And over two and a half months, 30,000 Punjabis courted arrest under the Tarm Yud Morcha, which was led by Sanjay Nair Singh Ji. So the agitation increased, increased, increased. And in June the, on June the 1st, 1984, it got to the point where Punjabis had agreed to stop 
any grain going out of Punjab and also any taxes being paid to the Delhi government as part of the Tarmud Murcha after another two years of peaceful protesting. Now, June the 1st, as we know, was an attack on Sri Harmandir Sahib and many people will question why was Sanjay Nelsingi in Sri Akal Takht? Why were the weapons taken? They shouldn't have been there. So first of all, the attack on Sri Harmandir Sahib in 1984 was not about Sanjay Nelsingi. It wasn't about Khalistan about to be declared. Because of this grain stop, because of the shipments stopping from going outside of Punjab, because of the taxes that were about to be halted, this propaganda ward created and this propaganda scheme had, had crossed all across India. And people were getting the belief that Sikhs within the Punjab are demanding their own place. They want to be independent from India. And as you guys will know, any patriotic Indian, for something to be taken away from Mother India, that's their worst nightmare. So people were feeding into the lies, people were feeding into the propaganda, and people were feeding into the false claims about Sanjay Nelsingi being a terrorist leader against Hindus and against the Indian government. So within 1982, in Thum Valley, a mock setup of Sri Harmandir Sahib is made two years prior to the actual attack. So the Indian government based this whole claim, this whole attack on it being a last minute job that had to be done before Khalistan was about to be declared, before the Singhs started to do something illegal. All these face false claims. Now there are many different forms of evidence to prove that this wasn't the case. The Doom Valley incident and the Doom Valley mock preparations for the attack on Sidi Harmandir Sahib two years prior is one of them. Secondly, they said that they wanted to arrest Sanjay Nelsingi. Sanjay Nelsingi was arrested in 1982 and freed with no charges. So that blows that argument out the window. Now, from our own point of view, from Punjabis, and also some Sikhs would say Sanjay Nelsingi shouldn't have been in a contact with weapons. The Sikhs shouldn't have been in a place of peace with weapons. Now, second, first of all, Sanjay Nelsingi was in a contact. What does a contact represent? The supreme authority, the supreme seat of that one who is a Kaal, a Wahiguru. And the supreme seat of Miri Piri De Malik, Guru Hargobin Sahib Ji Maharaj. Now, when Guru Hargobin Sahib Ji made a Kaal Takht, what was the first thing, one of the first things that they established at Kaal Takht? That was the Akal Sena. That was the forge, that was the army of the Khalsa. So to say, why were the Khalsa who were armed within a Kaal Takht, obviously makes no sense as well. Secondly, Sanjay Nelson Ji had had many tip-offs, and the things that were with Sanjay Nelson Ji had had many tip-offs, that an attack was imminent on the Shahidi Purb of Guru Arjun Dev Ji Maharaj. So secondly, if they wanted a quick exit, if they wanted minimal casualties, why on earth would you attack on one of the busiest days in the calendar at Sri Harmandir Sahib, the Shahidi Purb of Sri Guru Arjun Dev Ji Maharaj, our fifth king? Another point is many people will combat that point that Sanjay Nelson did the things were there with, with weapons. But Saad Singh Ji, this isn't the first time that we've had to defend Sri Harmandir Sahib, whether it was Baba Deep Singh Ji going against and fighting the um, forces of Ahmed Shah Abdali, whether it was by Sukha Singh, by Matab Singh going in and taking off the head of Masarangar. There have been many a times where we've had to defend Sri Akal Takht and Sri Harmandir Sahib. So this isn't the first time within our rich history. The whole point of attacking Sri Harmandir Sahib in 1984 was to quiet the voice of the Sikhs, was to shut us up and to remind us of where our place where our place lies within the Indian government and within India itself. And another point is, if they just wanted Sanjay Nelson, if they just wanted these so-called militants that were taking up refuge within Akal Takht, then first of all, why were all transport links allowed into, uh, um, allowed into Amritsar, but none were allowed to return? On the day of June the 1st, any Sangat that were allowed, that were going into Sri Harmandir Sahib were more than free to come in from any one or four of the entrances. But when trying to leave, no one was allowed out. So they were close, um, eventually building, building, building the populace within Sri Harmandir Sahib with a plan of mass casualty. If that's not enough evidence, then why were 38 Gurdwari attacked on the same day if Sanjana Singh and those so-called militants were just sitting in Harmandir Sahib? 
So Saj Bangaji, I hope that's more than enough evidence. And if there is, if anyone needs more convincing, then there's plenty more. I'm just talking about a wave within the ocean of the evidence that we have to provide us with the evidence that this wasn't a last minute attack. This had been thoroughly planned and thoroughly executed. So the Indian establishment move in and for three days there's no returning fire. Pai Menga Singh, who was an Akankitani Jatha Singh, a Babur Khalsa Singh, he was the first one to become Shaheed in a watchtower and he was shot in his matha. And just to let you guys know the kind of people, the kind of things that would fortify Sidi Harmandar Sahib, even whilst being shot in the midst of his matha, in the midst of his forehead, Pai Menga Singh fell to the floor and a Singh asked him, Pai Menga Singh, how are you? Pai Menga Singh looked at him and smiled and said, Jardikala, I'm still in high spirits. So these weren't any random rebels that had come to protect Sri Harmandar Sahib. These were Gursikhs, these were Sant Sifahis. Then we hear, we've all heard the accounts of people being locked up within the Karmari at Sri Harmandar Sahib, being told to drink their own urine. And in the midst of June, in one of the hottest times within India, people dying simply from a lack of water and starvation. And anyone that dared to come out on the Karma was shot in cold blood as well. So 1984, the attack took place and many Singhs were Shaheed, not just in Sri Harmandar Sahib, but across Punjab. Now for some reason, the Indian establishment thought that they were going to get away with this. And Indra Gandhi herself had two Sikh bodyguards, the Ad Singh and Satwan Singh. Now on October 31st, moving, moving down the timeline slightly because of time, Satwan Singh and Bian Singh avenged the genocide that Indra Gandhi sanctioned in June by shooting Indra Gandhi while she was leaving her house on October 31st. Now that sparks another genocide that we hear about within November. Now, Indira Gandhi was painted as Mother India. She was painted as the patron of India and, the, and patriotic Indians saw her as a mother figure. So when the news spread that Bian Singh and Satwan Singh had killed Indira Gandhi, there was outrage in the midst of every Indian because of the false news and because of the propaganda that they were being fed. And this whole war, this whole mahal, this whole atmosphere was created of it being a Sikh versus Hindu conflict, when really it was a government versus Sikh conflict. There were fake reports of train loads of Hindu bodies being sent from Punjab to Delhi, that Sikhs had started butchering people within Punjab, purely false. All these things were brought together to make the armed Hindu person, to make the armed Indian person vengeful against the Sikhs. And within the first few nights of November in 1984, we see another genocide, another attack, especially within Delhi. Now on October 31st, there are many accounts of Congress leaders coming together, giving out census records and hiring people called black cats. Now black cats are people who have been brought out of prison who are told to keep a dara, keep a star, and freely commit the crimes that you were put in prison for, but just do it looking like a Sikh. Rape, kill, loot, do whatever you want. And on the night of the 31st, there were paid people that went around to seek businesses, seek homes, and put crosses on anything that belonged to a Sikh, any capital of a Sikh, so that in the morning and the days to come, it would be easily identifiable where to target. Now the horrific, the horrific tales of what happened and what that culminated into in November you guys can read for yourself there are many books there are many articles but I just want to give you two eyewitness accounts of the rape of the looting of the mass murder that took place by mobs by government funded mobs within Delhi in November 1984 and one of the main villages hit was a place called Jalokpuri and in particular in Jalokpuri is a block called block 32 where every single man within that block was massacred. Imagine within your local town, every single banda, every single man being killed overnight, over, a few, over 32 hours, sorry. That was the state of Trilakpuri. And you can hear eyewitness accounts, many eyewitness accounts of the state of that village. One such eyewitness account is a reporter who initially was banned. So whilst over this time of emergency, there was a blackout of media because the Indian government didn't want the atrocities to get out to the Western world. People like Amnesty and International, Red Cross, all these people were banned so that nothing would come under the limelight. Now one eyewitness account reports that as he walked into 
Trilokpuri, a two-year-old girl came up to him, walking over dead bodies, and put his hands up, put her hands up to this reporter saying, please take me home. But what that little girl hadn't realized is that whilst walking over to this reporter, she not only walked over the body of her father, but also her two brothers as well. There were many, there was blood, the, free, the streets were filled with blood, and the streets were filled with rotting bodies, rotting carcasses that were left for the vultures. Another such incident is what people would do, especially in those times, is dress Monday up like Gurian. Because generally the mobs wanted to kill any boy, any man, no matter how young, how old they were. So dressing them up as girls would hopefully give them a chance of surviving. And if the mob saw a little girl, hopefully they'd take pity and just leave her. So there was one boy that was dressed up as a girl in ponytails, dressed up as a girl. And as he's running through the streets of Drilokburi after realizing that his whole family had been massacred, one of the mobs, one of the mob members, sees something weird about this young girl and shouts, is that a boy dressed up as a girl? And hearing this, this 10-year-old boy, as any of us would, puts, um, starts to fear for his safety and starts running. He starts running to where his father, his father's body was laying, dead in cold blood. And the mob grab this 10-year-old boy, throw him on top of that body of his father, pull tail over him and set them alight and say, let the snake burn with his snake father. So there was no mercy, no matter how young you were, no matter how old you were. That was the occurrences in November 1984. Lifetimes of work of Sikh businessmen were, take, were, were shattered within a night. And still till today, there's no justice being given for either June or November attacks. No payments given out to the victims, no such things. So after all this, it doesn't stop there. There's another attack on Sikhi through many operations, one of which was called Operation Woodrose, which went out again to exterminate any Sikh male and attack the psyche, attack the calm of Sikhi. And one act that's given presidents under this Operation Woodrose is this act of Tada. Now the act of Tada basically says that you can arrest, arrest anyone without any charge, and you can detain them for up to a year without charging them. So normally we'd go to a court and say, we are innocent until you're proven guilty. Under Tada, you're guilty until you're proven innocent. And by the use of this law, anyone could have been picked up just under suspicion, whether you were a six-year-old toddler boy, or whether you were a 60-year-old bazooka man. And under this excuse of Tata, many Sikhs went missing, many Sikhs were killed, and we'll talk about that a bit later on as well, when we mention a famous Guru Sikh just once in Kalara. So in 1986, the Qaum comes together under a Sarbat Khalsa, and a Sarbat Khalsa basically means, Sarbat means everyone, Khalsa is obviously the Qaum of the, of the Sikhs. So in this meeting at Khalsa, we realize that we are sitting slaves, we are sitting ducks within the country of India. The country that Sikhs have given so much for were now being persecuted within. So under the Banjimender uh, five member committee under, led under Jatadar Baba Mano Chahal, Gurbachan Singh Mano Chahal, the Sikh come together, Sikh come, come together and realize that we are Ghulam and we need our own freedom. And the declaration of Khalistan is given. Now, this revolution for freedom, many groups have set up and a war is taken upon the streets of Punjab in an attempt to bring vengeance to those people that brought injustice upon the Sikh calm and to protect those who are being oppressed. And this goes on for many years and I just want to give two accounts of two stories throughout this era, throughout this Kaar Kular, throughout this, this revolutionary era of two very famous Gur Sikhs and then we're going to wrap up. So the first one was by Anok Singh Babbar who was also there at the time of 1978 when the 13 Singhs became Shaheed and that incident itself created something within the midst of Bayan Ok Singh Babbar that turned him and transformed his life into a Gursikh and led him to a life of Seva and Qurbani. And cutting the story very short, Bayan Ok Singh Ji Babbar was a part of the Babbar Khalsa who were also a very talented group of Gursikhs who were also fighting against the regime. And he was picked up by the Punjab police one day and he was tortured for four days straight. 
his method of torture was such that he was hung upside down and many inhumane things done to him. His private parts would have been electrocuted. There would have been metal rods put through his stomach and also through his heel up into his gurda. All these kind of things we can't even possibly imagine to go through. But eyewitness, account, eyewitness accounts write that even through the midst of this, there was no cries of pain, there were no cries of let me free, let me go. And on the fourth day, after not being able to crack by an, uh, by an Oksinji Babur, they drop him and leave him in his own blood. By an Oksinji Babur, his eyes were also taken out, so he physically couldn't see anything. And he asked the Peridar, he asked the guy on guard, Bhai Sab, what time is it? The guard replies by saying it's 7.15 in the evening. And Bhai an Oksinji says, Chalo Tikya, it's time for Rehara Sahib. After four days of straight torture, Bhai an Oksinji keeps his rats first and starts reading Rehara Sahib. Such is the power of an amazing Gursik. You can go through such inhumane torture, but still keep Sikhi in the midst of his heart. And upon hearing this, the person who was, the, the, who was on guard at that time, he dropped his gun and he resigned and said, I can't do this, I can't do this anymore. These people are angels. I physically have, don't have the power to be a part of this. And even the leader of that police station is recording and saying, these people are magicians. They've made another one of my police officers leave. So that was the Saki of Bayan Oksing Di Babur. And also another famous Gursik from another group called Khalistan Liberation Force was Bayavdar Singh Di Brahma. And Bayavdar Singh Di Brahma was an amazing Gursik, a very Chardikala Gursik, who was from the Dal of Baba Bidijans, which still is around today under the guidance of Baba Avdar Singh Ji. And the Sakhi of Baba Bidijans stayed with Bayav Dar Singh Ji even in the midst of this Khair Kulahar. So the Sakhi was that Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji, a Sikh Guru, once saved Baba Bidijand when he was being, uh, when he was sat under Ag, when he was sitting under, a, uh, sitting on top of fire, hiding from Mughals that were chasing him. And at the time, Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji Maharaj said to the Sikhs, pour water on top of me. And the coolness that Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji was experiencing experiencing from that water being poured upon them, they were giving the laha to Baba Bidijan so that they could complete their seva. Now, Bhaiyavtar Singh Ji Brahma was from that dal and he was one of the most sought after Kharkus of the time. And after having a tip off from a local person within the village of Manakpur, 20,000 CRP Central Reserve police officers came and surrounded Manakpur. Now, Bhav Dar Singh Ji Brahma, with a few things, realized that the only way out was to fight their way out. And after having these 20,000 officers fire rains and rains of bullets upon Bhav Dar Singh Ji Brahma, his finger was cut and his thumb was shot. At this point, Bhav Dar Singh Ji did an ardas to Guru Har Gobind Sahib Ji Maharaj, saying, Maharaj Ji, just as you preserved the honor, just as you saved Baba Bidi Chand, please help me in the midst of this jung, in the midst of this yud. And some way or another they managed a lot of the things with Bhav Dar Singh Ramra at the time became Shaheed and they managed to break through a cord and escape and upon meeting the other things all the other things came and started tapping down Bhav Dar Singh Brahma, his the star, his jola and they were saying, Bhai Sahib, are you hurt? Are you hurt? and Bhav Dar Singh he said, I'm totally fine with Guru Sahib's Kirpa and what they realized is that there were bullet holes throughout the star of Bhav Dar Singh Brahma and also throughout the Chola Bhav Dar Singh Ji. But with Guru's Girpa and from the Ardas, none of them actually pierced his skin. So these miracles, these amazing Sakya that we hear from hundreds of years ago, still exist 30 years ago and still exist today. So just finishing off, I'm going to take five more minutes, Sad Singh Ji, just to finish off. We hear many stories throughout the 1984 and the Karkula up until 1993. And we hear many stories within Aitihas from hundreds of years ago. Now the power is still the same, the same miracles took place, the names of the Gurusikhs may have come and gone, but the source of the energy is sitting right here with us and that is Guru Granth Sahib Ji Maharaj. Now I talked about Bhai Avtar Singh Ji Brahma and Bhai Anok Singh Ji Babbar, how were they so fearful, how were they so fearless within the midst of all this crazy stuff that was going on in the midst of them? And we hear within Gurbani, Nirpa Japa, Sagar Paumita, by praying upon, by reciting upon that one that is Nirpao, who is Vahiguru themselves, what happens to us? Sagalapao Meta, all of our fears, Ometi Jande, they become distinct, they become extinct. Such was the level of these Gursikhs. And now, 
I don't want you guys to walk away thinking, feeling depressed or feeling anything bad because this is all within the hukum of Wahiguru and it's all part of the care of Wahiguru. And by Fawja Singh, one of the Shihid Singhs in 1978, in his book writes that Sikhi is a plant that needs to be nourished, that needs nutrients from blood time and time again. And throughout our history we've seen that it's been no problem for people to give Shihidiyah for this path because of the value of Sikhi. So just finishing off, within Bhai Gurdash Ji Zara, we hear Hukumayah Amdara Sabako, Manne Hukumayah Jur Sahaj Samawah. So all of this, whether we see it as bad or good, is within the Hukum of Maharaj. And that's what the Singhs realized at that time, that whatever is happening, whether it was good or it was bad, was all in the Hukum of Guru Sahib. Manne Hukumayah Jur Sahaj Samawah. Whoever mans this Hukum, whoever accepts this Hukum, so Sahaj Samawah, they become content and they have that true essence within the midst of them, just as all these things did, just as Guru Sahib is offering us now. Now Hukam we can take two ways. Hukam is the play of Wahiguru and also Hukam is what Guru Sahib has laid out for us. So whoever of us man this Hukam of Sikhi, whoever man whatever events are going on to be sweet, as Guru Arjan Dev Ji Maharaj said, Tera ki amita laga. Whatever Guru Sahib is doing to us, we accept it as sweet. So sahaj smave then also we can imbue that sahaj, that contentment within the midst of us. Now, a lot of good things also came out of this. There was a massive re re-emergence of Sikhi, and it was a massive wake-up call, a lot of people, including myself, from hearing of the Sakhi of 1984, and realizing that countless people were ready to give up their lives just like that for Sikhi, made me think that there must be something behind it, something very much worthwhile. So we've been in times much worse. We've been in times where there have been a few hundred pe Sikhs left, at the times of Pai Garja Singh, Pai Bhutta Singh. So we have been persecuted our whole lives and it's nothing new to us. But the point is here, as Guru Nanak Dev Ji Maharaj has said to us, Sikhi has come down from Wahiguru themselves. Guru Parameshwar Ekko Jan. The Guru and Parameshwar, the Guru and Wahiguru are the same. So a path that has been started by Wahiguru, no one will ever be able to defeat. And Guru Nanak Dev Ji Maharaj also say that Jinko Sadhguru Thapya, Tin Mirt Nasaka Ekoe. Whoever has given, established, whoever has been given the tapi, the pat on the back from the true Guru, Guru Granth Sahib Ji, Guru Gobind Singh Ji, Guru Nanak Dev Ji, the ten Gurus, then no one can even dare to overcome them, no one can even dare to overthrow them, no one can even dare to destroy them. As we've seen in our Qaum, as we've seen in our Itihas, and as we've seen in the times of 1984. So with Guru Sahib's Kirpa, may we all take away from this that imagine how much we thrive in bad situations, how, imagine how much we thrive when being attacked. We are under no grave danger at the moment. So let's, with Guru Sahib's Kirpa, may we gear up for any attack that is come eminent on us. And there will be soon, whether it's in 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, we are kind of in times of peace now. So with Guru Sahib's Kirpa, let's use this time to become strong within our Sikhi so that we can leave a lineage, we can leave a legacy just like those before us. So read upon this history. This Godwara is an amazing seva by having a whole, whole floor dedicated to the Shaheeds of 1984 and also after. So read their stories and feel inspired, take inspiration from it. On a personal level, as a Pant, let's get together and command ourselves and arm ourselves for whatever, whatever Guru Sahib has got in store for us next. So just lastly, this talk is dedicated to all the Shaheeds of 1984 and all the Shaheeds of the Qaum in general. But one person in particular who is by just one Singh Kalara who displayed to us that the battle wasn't just on the battlefield, it wasn't just with guns. Bhai just once in Kalara was a human rights advocate and a lawyer by trade. And there were three ways, I'm just going to finish with this last point, Saad Sangaji. There were three ways that in Operation Woodrose, the police would get rid of Sikh and Ojwan. The first one, should throw their bodies in the rivers. And there's even a report from Rajasthan, a formal complaint to the Punjab government saying, stop throwing your bodies in the rivers, they're polluting our water. So that's the first way. The second way would be a fake encounter. So planting a gun on a Singh or a, or a Singhani and saying that the heroic police shot this militant and they came out victorious when really he was just shot in the back. Now the third way was to cremate the body so that there's no trace left. Now just one Singh Kalara over his work, because there were no formal listings of the bodies of the people that came into the cremation grounds, what he did was he realized how much wood was coming to each crem in, into each cremation ground and by the amount of wood he extrapolated how many people had been cremated from x amount of wood 
he took these findings all over the world and in his last speech he mentions that in Amritsar alone from the crematorium grounds in Amritsar alone he found 2,000 missing children that had been burnt in crematoriums so that's just one of three ways that Sikhs were getting rid of and that was just in Punjab now a direct threat was given to just one Singh Kalara from the Indian government saying that if you found all these people be careful because you might be next on it after his speech, when he came back to Punjab the next day, Punjab uh, Singh Kalra was picked up from his house and never seen again in 1995. And again, whether it was on the battlefield or within the law courts, Nirpao Japa, Sagalapao Mita. But having that connection with Guru Sahib and keeping faith within Guru Sahib, he was fearless, even in the midst of threats. So may Guru Sahib do Kirpa, and also please check out their speech on YouTube, that we can follow the path of such amazing Shaheed Singhs, such amazing Gur Sikhs, and learn and delve in more to our history. So forgive me for going slightly over time and also forgive me for all the mistakes I would have made. Guru Sahib Kirpa Karan to bless us all with Jaradi Kala and Guru Sikhi Das and hopefully give seva to the Pants whenever they ask for it. Wai Guru Ji Ka Khalsa, Wai Guru Ji Ki Fateh. If you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, share and subscribe. Please donate and help spread Guruji's message. Link is in the description below. Vaheguru Ji Ka Khalsa, Vaheguru Ji Ki Fateh. Vaheguru.